welcome to this our very last uh, webinar in our series of surgical webinars thank you so much for joining us for the previous four uh, and perhaps some of you may have joined us for the previous series which is more um, infection prevention and related to cssd matters as you know, SAFMED is your solutions partner and we've been around for 30 years. We have an array of products to assist you from a CSSD perspective as well as in the operating theatres. So far in these webinars, we've covered a humongous amount of information. We've learned about our operating theatres, we've learned about the temperature in the operating theatre, we've learned some more about the ventilation, we've understood why we shouldn't have the theatre being too moist, we've understood about the risks associated with leaving swabs and strange instruments behind in patients, we've learned a little bit about managing our shops, how to avoid fires, how to streamline the instruments in our trays, how to worry about surgical timeout and the value add of surgical timeout and especially how to protect our patients. In today's webinar, we're going to focus on the following factors. We'll talk a little bit about uh, managing laryngoscopes, sharp safety, uh, patient positioning and ergonomics, ergonomics in the operating room for both the nurse and the doctor, surgical smoke, and we'll finish off with a, a brief introduction into nurse burnout. Laryngoscope blades and laryngoscope blades and their handles themselves can be high-risk items in the operating room. And of course, they're also used in other areas, used in ICUs and all sorts of settings and emergency settings. The blades come in different shapes, sizes and forms and of course have different uh, designs to them, the newer ones being more fiber optic, uh, fiber optic light bulbs that are not detachable. Um, in the olden days, we used to have a halogen light bulb, which is removable, and of course we have a number of those um, bulbs and blades still in place. So the design of the blade differs slightly, and um, they can be quite problematic to manage. Why do I say that? This is probably my most go-to uh, published paper that I always focus on when discussing laryngoscope blades because it really goes into such nice detail about what type of microorganisms they've found on them and uh, therefore it's the one that I tend to refer to the most. It's really and truly not the only published paper that discusses laryngoscopes because they are well researched and been associated with outbreaks of infections in all sorts of environments including neonatal ICUs. In this particular study, uh, they looked at 83 laryngoscope blades that were ready for use. They were then analyzed for uh, bacteria and fungi, um, and this was done at two different uh, university hospitals. They found microorganisms in 76.2% uh, of the uh, devices in one hospital and 92.7% of them in the other hospital. What worries me is the type of microorganisms that were found, Klebsiella pneumonia, multi-resistant Acinita balmi, uh, Candida, uh, Staph aureus, all very difficult um, microorganisms to manage, including E. coli. So there are things that we need to worry about and that they certainly are known to transmit disease. We don't necessarily look after them well. We tend to clean them with all sorts of strange bits and pieces, whatever soap we can find that's lying around. And then we leave them lying on, in, in, uh, in theatres, in uh, emergency trolleys. We don't necessarily manage them as well as we could or we should. Even in my own research, as part of my master's, I looked at laryngoscope blades where I swabbed the tip of the blade. You can see as indicated in the picture what part of the blade was swabbed, and a good percentage of them were indeed positive for residual proteins. So I didn't specify or test specifically for types of microorganisms, but I did look for, back to, uh, for a residual protein, of course, indicating that the device was definitely not clean. And these were all devices that were found ready for use in the operating room, lying on the anesthetic machine, ready to go. What about laryngoscope handles? I've only come across one published paper talking about laryngoscope handles, and this was in the Journal of Hospital Infection in 2010 already. 
where they took 192 specimens from 64 different laryngoscope handles uh, from 32 different operating theatres, and they used a semi-quantitative test method to assess for bacterial contamination. And as you can also read that they did additional tests for occult blood. No occult blood was found, but one or more species of bacteria were isolated in 86% of the handles themselves. I don't think we consider the fact that the blood, as we fold it down, touches onto the handle and there's great potential to transmit disease onto the handle itself. The handles are difficult to manage because of that, uh, the surface on it, you know, that surface is a little bit rough, so it does make it easy to grip, but, um, but not easy to clean. So I hope um, that your policies and processes are in place for how you manage your laryngoscope blades as well as your laryngoscope handles. Moving on to chat about sharps and sharps management in the operating room, I came across a really interesting paper from the Journal of Surgical Edu Education looking at medical students. We gave a lecture to some medical students the other day and it, it was quite pertinent that we saw this particular paper. The goal of this particular survey was a survey sent out to a variety of residents and medical students in an institution, to, in, in um, academic institution in New York. Uh, firstly, was quite interesting was how um, how the response rate was to the survey. It was wasn't spectacular, um, and of those that did respond, 55% of them had admitted that they had had a history of some form of sharps incident. 65% that they didn't report the incident merely because it was time consuming um, and uh, also because they thought that the patient was low risk and often medical students didn't report this due to the fact that they were a bit scared of being embarrassed or there would be some sort of punitive action taken against them for making a mistake. And I think that might be true as well in our setting. Hopefully these days all nurses report their injuries and, um, and are honest about these needle stick and, and uh, sharps injuries. We know like with any hazard, when you're managing a hazard, you're going to look at um, uh, the various uh, methods or steps that you can take and you're always going to start with trying to eliminate the hazard. So a suggestion out of this article from the Association of Operating Room Journal, for example, is perhaps you can use a skin stapler. Now, using a skin stapler will reduce the risk out of just one of the various needles on the, on the table, of course. Try to look at various engineering controls, so maybe some uh, circumstances where you can use self-retracting needles. Work practice controls like using um, hands-free techniques and inoculating people with hepatitis, hep B vaccines. And then, of course, administrative controls like training programs and quality uh, control things to manage various incidences. And then the last thing is PPE. Um, the students actually were talking about double gloving and whether or not double gloving was going to protect you. And double gloving is a concept, and, and it does remain a debate as to whether double gloving is going to help you at all with the sharps injury, um, but uh, certainly it, it does help under some circumstances. Again, another article or paper out of the ARN, Association of Operating Room Journal, that looks at it talks to the fact that the perioperative environment is a high-risk area, as we know, for exposure to bloodborne pathogens from percutaneous injuries. More than 40% of sharp and needle stick injuries occur um, in the operating room, and I agree that's really a really high-risk area. In um, at least 90% of the cases, the implicated device was indeed contaminated. If you have a look at the uh, picture on the left, you can see the devices that were involved. You can see syringes and suture needles were the most common uh, identified problem. This is an article uh, recently, or relatively recently, in the Journal of Hospital Infection that looks at needle stick injuries and the concept of surgical timeout. And what they were saying was that perhaps it's important within the uh, timeout process just to take a minute to talk about um, the high risks associated with needle stick. So you could, in the in the timeout, say this patient has uh, hepatitis or this patient has a history of drug abuse, uh, making the team aware of the potential risk associated with this particular patient. Again, we know that perioperative briefings and timeouts can improve teamwork and communication, can improve perceptions about safety in the operating room, and hopefully can lead to fewer um, events.
this particular paper looked at risk factors um, for the circumstances leading to needle stick and sharp injuries in doctors in operating rooms. Um, uh, this paper comes out of Japan. They divided the, the patient's period in the hospital or in the operating room into five different zones. Um, as you can see, entering the operating room, start a surgery to one third of the procedure, two thirds into the procedure, zone four, two thirds to the end of the surgery, and zone four, the end of the surgery. And as you can see, the majority of needle surgeries were happening towards the end of the surgery. It seemed in, in their analysis that the risk was greater when the surgical procedures ended after 8 o'clock in the evening. And that would seem quite logical in terms of people being fatigued. Passing techniques. Um, I, I trained back in the day when we did everything by hand, so I placed uh, mostly mostly passed instruments uh, directly to surgeons' hands, including scalpels. And he sort of uh, later on in life had we started to move to, um, to passing techniques using hand-free in the neutral zone, of course. So instead of direct hand-to-hand -hand passing, moving on to the uh, neutral zone and passing uh, using uh, devices. So theoretically, as is described in this um, uh, journal article, the hands-free technique should be that no two preoperative per personnel will ever simultaneously touch the sharp, and the modified technique where, you, where, where necessary because the surgeon can't take his eyes away from where he's looking, you will pass the instrument into his hand, but he will return the sharp into the neutral uh, safe zone. From the same article, uh, it also discusses the fact that uh, it's evident that theatres are high-risk settings and that more than 44% of sharp injuries occur in the operating room, similar to the previous paper. Suturing accounted for the greatest number of sharp injuries. Passing needles and scalpels and other sharps were associated with between 8 to 27 percent of sharp injuries. And for some reason, uh, quite a few of the papers that I would read seem to indicate that of late, the last couple of years, four or five years, there seems to be an increase in the number of sharp injuries in operating rooms all over the world of late. I'd be quite curious to know if the same applies in the South African setting. We, we chatted to the uh, young surgeons and uh, we were teaching them how to uh, rotate the needle down so that uh, when they placed the needle holder back on the, on, the, um, on the surface or wherever they were putting it, that at least the needle was facing away from, from us so that we would be safe. This paper goes on to also discuss a, a review of the literature about using the hands-free technique. There were 14 studies that met their inclusion criteria. And in there, what they, what they came to report on is that the compliance with the hands-free or the neutral or the safe zone technique only ranged between, five, well, ranged between 5 to 84%. And I suppose that's dependent on a number of things. According to them, the compliance approved when there was um, a proper understanding of the perceived risk of the patient's infectiveness. Um, and, of course, when people were aware of the evidence regarding the effectiveness of the hands-free technique. I do wonder if age of the surgeon plays a role in that, um, as well as, obviously, the attitude approach and, and uh, knowledge of the theatre sister uh, concerned. Right, talking a little bit about patient position. We are moving on to actually discussing ergonomics of the nursing staff when manage patients for patient positioning. But of course, to remind ourselves that the goal of patient positioning is as follows to obviously allow access to the surgical site, uh, to ensure that the anaesthetist has access to the patient, to prevent nerve damage, to prevent musculoskeletal injury, and that the patient is safe and comfortable at the end of the day, but we can still perform the surgery that is required. Of course, good theatre staff are going to always consider uh, pressure injuries and the risk of pressure injuries for the patient, and by doing so, will take into account or consider the fact of the patient's age, the patient's nutritional status, the condition of the skin, the comorbidities that affect skin perfusion, the patient's BMI, 
the patient's peripheral perfusion. And taking those all into account will hopefully um, provide all the necessary devices and tools that we can to make the patient safe, ensuring the mattress is correct, the type of mattress that you're using, especially, of course, also taking into account the length of the surgery and how long that patient's going to lie in a particular position for. And hopefully then we've got all the right tools and accessories in place to try and prevent any, issue, any issues or injuries to, to the patient. Moving on to talking about common musculoskeletal injuries amongst nurses. Um, this particular paper referred to um, uh, types of devices that we could use to, to try to prevent the injuries or manage the injuries. It was from Professional Nurse Today, so it involved not just the operating room, everybody as a whole. They identified the following risk factors, which, which are quite common to divide them into intrinsic and extrinsic. Um, extrinsic, of course, related to improper wear and inadequate ergonomics of so the types of shoes, the, you know, from computer screens through to uh, where we hang the, uh, the monitors in the operating room. <clears throat> Environmental factors like hard floor surfaces, non-systematic, non-systemic like smoking, medications that could all play a role. Intrinsic factors being systemic and non-systemic, um, including old age, uh, as some nurses are aging, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and then abnormal uh, biomechanics, muscle inflexibility, decreased muscular strength and joint laxity. Another interesting paper looking at ergonomics, an important factor in the operating room, so moving specifically to the operating room. This was a review to highlight the importance of ergonomics in the operating room and to determine ergonomic risk factors and, of course, to offer possible solutions for nurses. Work-related musculoskeletal disorders, that's quite a mouthful to say, uh, can arise due to unhealthy um, ergonomic conditions. And, of course, good ergonomic conditions will increase um, occupational nurse health and safety, job satisfaction and performance at the end of the day. The paper goes on to discuss uh, one particular study which was done in 2009 that looked at the prevalence of work-related muscul musculoskeletal injuries amongst perioperative nurses and the, the majority of the complaints came out of uh, lower back pain, next on the list was ankle, foot and shoulder and third was neck. This paper then goes on to discuss um, risk types in the operating room and they define them into um, to three categories, physical, cognitive and organisational risks. The physical looks at things like lifting and moving and various positions that one ends up standing in, the physical setting, equipment that needs to be manoeuvred. Cognitive uh, risk factors included conflict and low ability for to influence decision making. And organizational factors included long work hours, perhaps things like uh, forced overtime or needing to work even while you were ill. Something that does happen quite regularly. Now, I know we can't read all of what's on the slide, um, but this paper is readily available and was a, a free download. So if you'd like the paper itself or the link to the paper, please give me a shout and we can send it to you with the greatest of pleasure. But what it does do in this particular table is list um, the risks themselves, um, as well as a series of recommendations and all three factors, the physical, the cognitive, and the organizational. So what I did was I took out a few of them and I've gone into a little bit of detail in the next few slides of some of the factors that I think are quite common to all of us. Right, physical factors. Lifting and moving, and a lot of these are logical that we know anyway, um, but 
won't do us any harm to review them. Lifting alone, of course, never lift a patient alone and always lift on the count of, of three. The reason being that when you're lifting on the count of three that you are, no one person is taking a bigger load, plus you will lift, get your body ready so that you're not off balance. Always remember that when you're lifting, always lift closer to the body, not from a distance because you will injure yourself. Various positions that we end up in, and that's very difficult to change because we do need to stand at strange um, um, angles occasionally, but important wherever possible to change your posture, have some small pauses in between, and then good visual ergonomics, so um, appropriate eye monitors level, so adjust your monitors. Hopefully you have got the, the monitors on arms off the, off the lights so that you're not um, straining and those can be adjusted accordingly. Of course, we have to take into account the fact that we've got some really tall surgeons and some really short surgeons, and, and the same applies to nursing staff, and these are factors we have to take into account. Physical factors and physical settings and the risks um, uh, that, of course, came to mind first up were slippery or wet floors, certainly something of great importance in an operating room and makes good sense, of course, to immediately clean up any spills and even floor surface, surfaces. So again, making sure that the operating table break is on properly, even though you've got uneven surfaces and trying to eliminate cl um, clutter and obstructions. So um, again, um, very very helpful to lift all of your equipment up onto booms wherever you can. Equipment itself, broken equipment, making sure that everything is clean and well maintained and serviced um, and repairing any broken appliances, trolleys or cables or or anything really because it's quite important we don't die, we don't injure ourselves and wearing lead, lead aprons um, the solution is limit the number of times a lead apron is worn and that we know is impossible to do if you have um, surgery that requires the use of a lead apron then you will need to wear your lead apron just very difficult to um, to change that cognitive factors um, in their mind, the um, ability to do or the inability to be able to influence any form of decision making in the operating centre, so, um, this is, is quite an important factor. Um, and for the solutions, there, of course, they promote positive, effective communication to avoid conflict, deal with unexpected behaviours, and ensure nurses feel valued and trusted, and try give them opportunity to be involved in the decision making, so that at the end of the day, it makes their life a little easier. Organisational factors: long work hours, first forced overtime, and working while ill. And of course, there they discuss the possibility of flexible uh, work scheduling, which is sometimes possible, but not always. Recognising good performance, of course, and don't ignore nurses' suggestions. All factors that are risk factors in our own ergonomics. I really enjoyed this paper published late in 2019. Um, it comes out of Turkey, and uh, the, one of the author, authors also um, uh, was part of um, or was part of one of the previous papers that we'd already read, uh, just going into more details around some of the concepts in this particular paper. Quite obvious, unsafe ergonomic conditions in the operating room can cause or contribute to uh, back injuries and other musculoskeletal disorders, and that we are often exposed as nurses in, in the operating room to a variety of hazards, chemical hazards, biological hazards, environmental hazards that can lead to slips and trips and falls and respiratory ailments, uh, fatigue, nervousness and headaches. In this particular um, study, they observed 58 surgeries, as you can see, across 10 different surgical specialities, and they took note of a variety of um, safety-related issues. None of the operating rooms had any surgical smoke evacuation systems in place. And to the best of my knowledge, not many um, theatres in the South African setting have any systems in place for surgical smoke evacuation. 5.2% of those particular, this is in Turkey, remember, um, theatres that they observed had no evacuation systems for anaesthetic gases. I think some of our theatres do, and we don't always necessarily use them or use them correctly. 
94% uh, of the operating theatres had enough of the required instrumentation sets, which was great, and those sets were complete. The functions on the operating table to allow adjustment of for patient positioning were not working in all instances, and the ability to adjust the height of the theatre table was not working, and that's pretty sad, and that of course talks the importance of servicing our tables regularly. 5.2%, I thought that was a bit lower uh, than I expected, had modular equipment suspended, um, suspended on booms, which was great because they were easy to use, but the rooms were too small. So it was actually quite difficult to use them. They weren't really able to use them effectively. So very important considerations to take into point when you are designing a theater or you're revamping a theater or you're installing a set of lights, um, whether or not you can put booms in as well to make the ergonomics better for the self. And then one of my pet topics is surgical smoke. Surgical smoke is smoke that results from the contact of human tissue with lasers and electrosurgical pencils, commonly used for dissection and hemostasis during surgery. Like cigarette smoke, surgical smoke can be seen and it can be smelled, and um, it does create unpleasant odors that have been shown to have mutagenic potential. Let's dig into some more detail. Surgical smoke, possible side effects or adverse health effects from surgical smoke. As you can see, it's quite an extensive list. And I sometimes don't think we realize that. Sorry, door opening and closing, just trying to reduce the noise. Possible adverse health effects, of course, headache, eye irritation, asthma, chronic bronchitis, dizziness, sneezing, skin irritations, I thought cardiovascular dysfunction, that was a bit tricky. Uh, hepatitis, that surprised me, but I thought that was quite interesting. Nausea and vomiting, I, I could understand. Weakness and fatigue, allergies and coughing and rhinitis, those all seem quite logical. Anxiety, mm, that was interesting. Carcinoma, leukemia from surgical smoke. And we've been exposing ourselves to this for many, many years. Um, this paper goes on to discuss the fact that surgical smoke is formed, of course, uh, when we raise the intracellular temperature of tissue to at least 100 degrees C, causing tissue uh, vaporization in the form of surgical smoke. Surgical smoke contains components known to be health hazards like benzene, toluene, hydrogen cyanide, formaldehyde, volatile organic compounds, viruses and bacteria. I'm familiar with a few colleagues that have, uh, well, particularly a colleague who has developed um, HPV in her throat um, as a result of exposure in the operating room. Um, she has a, a whole series of nodules that are formed on her throat. She's had 18 laser surgeries, um, and the, um, the nodules have now moved down into her lungs, and she has to undergo chemotherapy now to try and treat them in her lungs. So this is all exposure under these difficult circumstances. PPE in 95 mask is not going to help um, in this regard. It'll help you from a virus and a bacteria perspective, but it won't help you from the chemical uh, perspective. Again, went into, uh, was reading some um, OSH uh, information from the US on what, um, what to wear to protect you from um, surgical smoke. Formaldehyde, of course, we are often also exposed to from a, um, a specimen uh, a point of view. I don't know about you, but I've been in theatre. We've dropped one of those um, large two or five litre jars, I can't remember what size they are, onto the field, onto the floor that smashed with a huge amount of formaldehyde exposure. So we definitely are exposed to a variety of, of, of these components that are detrimental to our health, and we need to make sure that we can find ways to manage them. Um, here you can see the estimates are that 500,000 healthcare workers are exposed to surgical smoke every year, and perioperative nurses report twice the incidences of respiratory problems when compared with the general population. Eliminate the hazard, use engineering controls, use smoke evacuation methods, try to put policies and procedures in place, and of course educate everybody and where possible wear the correct type of PPE.
All right, summing up and moving on to nurse burnout, we know um, burnout is a phenomenon affecting those in the helping profession, first described in the 1970s and characterized by emotional exhaustion, physical and emotional overload experienced by nurses and or other healthcare workers as a result of interactions with co-workers and patients. I thought a very relevant point there, co-workers and patients. Of course, what do we see? Typically, it also occurs in nurses with more than 10 years experience, higher in the speciality areas. So that includes that includes us and, of course, uh, the um, ICUs as well. We expect to see a spike in sick leave, absenteeism, nurse turnover, and decline in work effectiveness. Risk factors include exposure to death and dying, um, excessive workloads uh, in terms of physical and emotional demands. How do we prevent nurse burnout? Well, there is no magic trick, that is for sure. We often need to work long hours um, and proper sleep is important and of course health diet to try and manage our energy and developing resilience.